Defence has always driven, in many ways, uh, computing. Through the 70s, basically the development of uh, computer chips was pr predominantly dr driven by the Department of Defence. Uh, we're seeing a transition now with the gaming industry and computer consoles where now it's the external uses of computing that's driving the investments in specific types of chips. So that's made it very interesting for us to basically be able to use those architectures. But uh, as a result of the NNSA work pioneering supercomputing and the rest of the Department of Energy's engagement, what you're seeing now is that large supercomputers have been used for many defense applications, de development of aircraft, um, looking at some improved electronics manufacturing, making new materials. And I think one of the revolutions I think we'll see in our scientific world is a computational biology as they start to look at these advanced computing platforms and start to use it for under, to use it to understand the formation of new chemicals, uh, to understand how sort of biology works. When we brought up Roadrunner, we uh, had a period when it was undergoing its stabilization and we invited um, scientists to uh, help us stabilize the machine by running their applications. And we swept a, uh, a wide net, and so we had a number of interesting uh, uh, science-related uh, work that was done on Roadrunner. We had people looking at um, helping to model uh, HIV um, uh, proteins. Uh, Betty Korber here is uh, pretty has been working her whole career and trying to find a cure for AIDS, and so she. Uh, ran her application on uh, Roadrunner to help her understand uh, how uh, the AIDS virus uh, replicates itself and to see if there wasn't some common theme in all of the variants of the, uh, the AIDS virus that could be uh, um, identified, uh, some similarity identified that they could then develop uh, a vaccine for that. Historically, what we've used supercomputers for is to simulate physics problems. And one of the things that the group that I'm leading is interested in is what other kinds of, of applications that are important to, to humanity, basically, could we, could we solve using a machine like that. And those applications tend to have kind of different, uh, different characteristics or properties from the ones that we typically think of as supercomputer applications. So examples are things like looking at uh, large medical databases and trying to find, find um, you know, what kinds of drug interactions might be causing patients problems and things like that. And so essentially what we're looking at is uh, moving supercomputing from just a simulation-based activity to one where the computer itself can form hypotheses. In fact, there are many uh many examples I think but I'll use one to illustrate uh, the capabilities that we had that uh, that helped in a national uh, help with a, a national question or a question that was important for the nation and that is uh, the Columbia accident uh, many people thought that uh, the re that ice coming off of the external tank hitting the leading edge wing on the Columbia couldn't possibly have caused the kind of damage that they saw that took the shuttle out of the air uh, it turns out that some thought that potentially that could be a problem. Uh, many folks thought that you, that couldn't possibly have caused that breach because they had designed the wing to, uh, to accept the kind of hits that would come from ice coming off, uh, off external sources and hitting that leading edge. Uh, but it turns out that as carbon fiber ages, its properties change. And some scientists at Sandia uh, thought that this possibly could be the problem and ran some calculations on the Red Storm machine that we had available at the time, uh, which at the time was a little over 100 teraflops. I don't remember the exact, uh, the exact size. But they ran calculations for several days that indicated that at a certain age, the, the carbon fiber material could weaken to a point where ice hitting it at a certain velocity uh, could actually breach it. And after they uh, explored that possibility, they went out and did the experiments where they threw uh, masses of uh, the size you could expect from ice at 
some aged carbon fiber, and sure enough, it, it cracked the carbon fiber. And in the end, ultimately, they determined that that was the cause. But, but early in the investigation, there were many doubters that said this possi couldn't possibly happen until they got the, uh, the information and the data from the calculations that, that made them go look in that area and ultimately find the cause. So one of the things that people are quite concerned about is global warming, right? And so the whole um, field of trying to understand what our global climate is and will be over the next decades has uh, come about through these sophisticated models of our global climate. And without powerful supercomputers, we would be unable to make these predictions. Uh, before we had computers, you know, predictions about, uh, you know, where our global climate was going to, uh, uh, you know, which direction it was going, uh, was based on extrapolations from, uh, you know, data that we gathered from the past. Um, but the environment today is changing, right? There's man-made influences that didn't exist in the past. And so without uh, computing, we won't be able to really understand uh, the effects that we're having on our climate. Uh, we're at a real exciting time. I think we've shown that computing really has transitioned, that massive supercomputing has transitioned the way we are doing stockpile stewardship when coupled with the right experimental tools. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, the other piece of good news is we are really showing how we can influence a stockpile through you know, fundamental science coupled with these computers. The other thing though is that we've learned that you know, we could do more. You know, we need to be able to do large calculations uh, where maybe some parts of it are you know, we're res resolving the, the calculation at scale lengths less than the size of a human hair. Uh, when you start adding up all the physics, all the resolution that you need, you start getting to the fact that we are at a petaflop scale. We probably need to go another factor of a thousand or so in our computational capability and move to exascale. So I think you'll see not only just NNSA but the whole Department of Energy work together to move computing to that level. Uh, there's some fundamental challenges. Uh, if you just did a simple power scale and you end up with very, you know, near power stations required to power these computers, obviously that's not possible. So there are going to have to be some real breakthroughs in the uh, design and uh, operation of computer chips to allow us to get there. But it's the sort of scientific and technical challenge that the department loves.